one of the problems that I found a lot, and I found it, uh, for many, many years, is that the average person can't actually picture what a what a good green future looks like. They don't understand. They can't visualize what rewilding look, looks like at scale. They can't visualize what it might be like to go on a safari in a traditionally quite nature depleted country. So what comics do is you can go anywhere, any point in time, and if you can draw the thing and you can imagine the thing, it can be true. <laughs> Paul Goodenough is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Rewriting Extinction is a global storytelling movement uniting scientists, activists, writers, artists, and more to save as many species from extinction as humanly possible. Although the power of, all through the power of viral comics. Paul is an Emmy-nominated and award-winning writer, producer, entrepreneur, and environmentalist working across broadcast, comics, digital, games, and publishing. Paul is the designer and founding member of BAFTA, Albert um, Calculator and Sustainability Accreditation used by Netflix, NBC, Universal, Warner Brothers, BBC, IMG, Sky, etc., and advises across government and the environmental NGO sector, enabling better cohesion and efficiencies. Paul is the founder of Rewriting Extinction, a global storytelling project over uniting over 300 activists. And I had the wonderful, great fortune to meet him live at the Global Goals House in Glasgow, Scotland. And... I am so glad that you're here. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. So good to see you. Really good to see you too, Mark. And, uh, and honestly, the pleasure and honor was mine. Uh, as soon as I met you at, at Goals House, I just, there was just an instant connection. And yeah, you have such a natural warmth about you that, it, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And I, I feel the same about you. I, I, I really kind of attacked you. I, I uh, stumbled right upon you and says I gotta have you You can't go anywhere else no one else can talk to you because um, I, I've been looking at the work that you've done and compiled and really it's amazing I was a big fan and the way it happened is um, I've had Sarah um, uh, Goldmark uh, Sarah Greenfield Clark Greenfield Clark on yeah, the podcast. She, she, she's wonderful. And uh, I saw her sitting there and I went up and hugged her and she immediately then also introduced me and says, yeah, I'm here because the, the, the most important comic book on earth. And that's really what, what we're here to talk about and the success of it. And I was lucky enough to to get a beautiful uh, inscription from you. Thank you so much. That's uh, also such a big fan uh, of yours. Um, to start out, uh, just really get get some very basic things out of the way uh, that you hear a lot. First of all, you look absolutely amazing considering you've just been on a hellacious whirlwind tour. We saw each other at COP. You were totally engaged every single day at COP26. But after that, I almost think the schedule after that up until now has been hellacious as well. What have you been doing? How has that been going? Tell us about, about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, been, it's been incredible. It's been lots of different things. It's been incredible. It's been exhausting. It's been engaging and enlivening empowering but it's also been the hardest thing i've ever done in my life um so i've actually been on the road now for i think just over five weeks so we launched in the uk the, the book launched in the uk at the end of october so i was going to places like the lakes international comic fest to introduce it to the audience there then i was two weeks at cop then after that thought bubble and then another con and then another convention and it, like I said, it's, it's really it's a really beautiful thing because I sp I've been two years making this this book and this project and almost all of it has been here in in these four walls just video calling people and you of course you you, you feel inside you is something important and something really beautiful but it's when you actually get people coming up to you holding your book or saying they've heard about the project 
and it's changed something in them. That's when you get that moment of just welling up of all the two years of drama and the, the problems and the, the, the sacrifices all becomes worth it. And um, I've got to tell you, actually, there's one thing that happened in Harrogate, which was at Thor Bubble Convention. And um, there was this quite young family and the father and the mother were sort of, sort of looking quite hesitant by the table. They sort of like kind of shuffled over and being very, very kind and very, uh, um, and very thoughtful, not wanting to sort of intrude too much. And they said, oh, I hope, hope you don't mind, Paul. Well, I was there with uh, my co-writer, Sarah. And he said, your book has actually changed our lives. I thought, oh, okay, that's just like a, a nice thing to say. Um, but actually it turned out to be true because what had happened in their family was that their children were quite young and the children couldn't find the words or the terminology to describe to their parents what they were worried about, what they cared about environmentally. And our very small, very simple comic books was something they could look at, both the parents and the children understand. And the kids literally picked up the book and they'd be pointing at the comic and saying, this dad, this is what I want you to do. And that, yeah. So although, yes, I'm absolutely exhausted, it's those little things that stick in my mind and keep me, uh, keep me going. They keep you energized, I'm sure. I'm sure many of those things keep you energized as well. And uh, I'm sure you have more uh, stories than that uh, that you've experienced with this book. This book is truly, yes, it's a comic book. It's, it's beautifully done. I mean, I'm just going to uh, uh, show, even though this is an audio and video podcast, there are just amazing illustrations, black and white, full color um, throughout the entire book, it doesn't even do it justice for me just to show you uh, a couple of them. It, it's an amazing read, but it's also can be put into chunks so that you can digest it as needed. And then when you feel that tipping point or that point where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to get this existence overwhelming of what's going on. I need to take a pause and come back to it. You can. Um, when I first uh, read it um, was before you even uh, gave me uh, the signed version. I um, got more than halfway through the book just on, on the first sitting. And it's so wow. wonderful. It's, yeah. Yeah. Great it's, it's, so, yeah it's, 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 it's such a wonderful read. And, and uh, I want to, I want to wait a little bit to, to get into more why I think this is so vital uh, coming up in the future. The second basic thing we need to get out of the way is, oh my gosh, look behind you. Look at this uh, amazing wall of uh, collectors, items, books, comic books. You, ha th this is not your first rodeo book, a comic book, so to say. You uh, have done Sherlock Holmes and How to Train Your Dragon and, and many, many more. You're mm -hmm. obviously um, in the comic arena um, and have been doing this very well and received your accolades, as I, as I mentioned in, in the beginning. Um, I, I love that because I think that's a vital part. I do a lot with the United Nations for Resilience Frontiers, the Resilience Lab and, and things, which are talking about beyond the sustainable development goals. As you know, I'm an advocate, but it kind of gets into how can we build resilience in the system? How can we talk about the future? What is the future that we're moving towards? And, and some of those comics, or I'd say a good majority of those comics behind you are probably depicting all sorts of future visions or possibilities through visualization and illustration of just because you can imagine it, just because you can draw it, doesn't mean that we can't also achieve something similar for, for humanity. And so I, I, I like that uh, um, quite a bit. And, and, and the question is, in all these years of experience with doing comics, with doing that, how have you seen being almost this comic futurist or this futurist thinking about different worlds and different scenarios, has that helped you in your, your fight towards the extinction and your fight towards climate change, your fight towards the sustainability that, you, you know, you, you also have strong feelings on that and, and mm. also opinions? Yeah, one hundred percent. I often use the the, the story of uh, Star Trek 
basically Star Trek has helped all of us desire a future that didn't exist at the time. So whether you're talking about the kind of the, the, the diversity and inclusivity of what they actually achieved on the ship or the, the technology and the touchscreen stuff that they were using, what Star Trek did really well is it presented a future that people wanted and that people could then visualize. And one of the problems that I found a lot I found for many, many years, is that the average person can't actually picture what a, what a good green future looks like. They don't understand. They can't visualize what rewilding look, looks like at scale. They can't visualize what it might be like to go on a safari in a traditionally quite nature depleted country. So what comics do is you can go anywhere, any point in time. And if you can draw the thing and you can imagine the thing, it can be true. You can make it in a comic. and that's why I chose comics um, is because you can do anthropomorphic stories. You can actually delve into making species talk and delve into their thought patterns, their wants, their desires, their needs. But you can also go backwards through time, forwards through time. So we've got stories about dinosaurs, like one amazing one by Dinos in Comics, which is a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex talking to a tortoise. And the Tyrannosaurus says, Promise me you'll look after this world when I'm gone, because it's a dinosaur, it's not going to live. And the tortoise says, of course. And then the, the next three panels is a tortoise watching humanity destroy the planet, saying, I promised, I promised, I promised, but it can't stop humanity destroying the planet. And that had millions of views. Um, I should also say for your, for your, your listeners and your, and your viewers, what we've done with most of the stories, to go back to Mark's point earlier, is our stories, our comic stories, are usually into two buckets, really. One of them is a multi-page narrative story. The other is comics designed for social media. So what we do in those is we make stories that don't have facts, they don't have figures, they're not scientifically led, they're just emotive. They just are there to basically for you to read the comic, understand a little bit about the problem or the solution, and just have a bit of fun. And that comic I just mentioned there was one of our um, one of our best performing social comics. I think it had like you know seven million views, something like that, on Instagram alone. And across rewriting Extinction, we've had over 115 million views now, and we're still making new comics all the time. Oh, I but absolutely yeah. love that. <laughs> that 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 is, I mean, it's it's really unbelievable when you think about it. The the reach and the impact that you can have with this narrative. Before, uh, I want to get it more into that. And the last question on our basic start out is really, we've been through almost two years now of crazy times, not just the pandemic, but also Black Lives Matters and Asian racism, a crazy inauguration, Brexit, mm -hmm. and many, many other things, climate catastrophes around the world. So one, I, I, I want to honestly know how, how have you weathered that time up until now, how, how have you made it? Um, um, just honestly, and going back to the question that I just asked you, that in any of those visions of your comics, your drawing, your writing, your 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 that whole world that you were submerged into, did that prove to help get you through this crazy time? Did that did anything snap or change in you? Was there some models or some learning lessons that you can? I mean, you, you depart many of them in here, but are there some learning lessons you can maybe say, give us an experience on how that time was for you? Yeah, it, um, it was everything you said. It, it was two years of moments of utter clarity and focus where actually all of the world's external factors just drove me forwards and thought no, this, this, this needs to happen. You know, there's whether it's COVID or whether it's the, uh, the, the socioeconomic problems that the world's facing, that actually spurned me forward because I'm like, you know, no one's really talking about biodiversity loss. No one's really talking about 200 species going extinct every day. This is my mission. This is what I need to do. I need to make sure this is, is brought to fruition. But there were all some really, really dark times personally. Um, as I expect anyone listening can imagine, um, Anyone who's ever tried to organize a party between 10 or more people, it's rough. <laughs> Trying to organize 10 or more people is rough. And because I'm an idiot, what I thought I'd try and do is, you know, 300 people in all the different time zones 
across the planet. So um, I was getting up in the middle of the morning, so sort of two, three, four in the morning to talk to people in Australia and Los Angeles because I should have explained our comics are collaborations. So they're collaborations between people who have access to an audience and they care about the matter, an expert who knows the subject matter, usually myself and I'm quite often the gag writer, and then a comic writer and artist. And between us, we come up with the idea. So there was, well, there's been over 180 comics made by Rewriting Extinction. I was involved, I would say, in over 130 of them. So that's over 130 individual collaborations to manage. And because of COVID and people's mental health during that time, it was just a lot more difficult for some people to be committed as they would be in a normal professional working week. Um, and also it was, it, in my opinion, it was, it was also, it really helped some people. So some of our creators really loved it because it gave them purpose and something to push towards. Others really struggled. And I, because I was, I guess, central to the whole piece, a lot of that kind of the, the, the mental health issues and stuff, I was trying to look after basically a good few hundred people and look after their mental well-being, and also make sure that they felt that their words were being heard and their stories being told. So yes, that was tough. And I really is on kind of an answer your question yet, <laughs> but I'm getting there. Um, so yeah, there was some really dark times. And what I found um, personally, and I think I also speak for Jenny Ginia, who's one of our top creators, is that comic art and storytelling is a vessel you know, if you if you basically feel you've got this kind of this blackness inside you, this kind of this this creeping malaise or this this basically overarching sort of feeling that, that the world's coming at you, with comics and storytelling, you've got a bucket to put that into. You pour it into it, and then you can appreciate it like a work of art. You can step back and say, yeah, this this is my depression. This is my hope. This is my anxiety. This is my guilt. You've got different stories that kind of represent that. And although yes, you still feel it inside, it's cathartic and it's it's helpful. So the answer is yes. <laughs> the smaller it's, it's answer like, is yes, it actually does help. It's like a vessel, uh, a way to release, but also to to kind of deal with it in, in some respects. So I'm glad you shared that because I think it's so, so vital to, to just follow up on that. Do you think that all this dealing with comics in the past, all your past experiences, maybe helped you through this time a little bit better made, made it so that you could even though you were pulling the book together and you know 300 i mean you have uh wonderful people uh cara del Vinci, jane goodall ricky Gre uh, gravis um ta ta taika white yeah. <laughs> yeah and many many more celebrities in there and it's mm. not about the celebrities it's about uh the the messages in there but that you were in a position to say, hey, we're going to get through this. So kind of almost, not, this is a counselor psychologist, but you're helping them through this, but also showing that, hey, this is a release or look at what we could have if we just make a few shifts or if we do this, the outcome could be this. And let me help you visualize it or let me help you uh, understand how to get that into words. Uh, I, did, in, did any of that help? I mean, or, or did you say, no, I'm, I'm so glad I had that experience in the past way before you know for the, all the years you've been doing this yeah so comic comics are fantastic because they allow you to very simply and easily duck into another world and shorthand your way for a whole life that you've never lived that's what comics do better than any other medium because with tv and film and music and all the rest the the the, the creator the editor the writer whoever it might be the musician they're defining the tempo of the story and they're also defining your experience of the story um with comics, you're, you're in control, you're turning the pages, you're deciding what you're reading and what speed. And yeah, so um, comics are a really nice way to relax um, and also just to transport yourself out of, out of a normal world. And that mentality absolutely is, is central to uh, what I approach the, the, the celebrities, the stars, the musicians, the, the, the politicians, the, the scientists, all of whom were involved because it enabled me to enabled all most comic book readers and writers 
to imagine a world that, that we haven't seen yet. Um, and it's great, you know, because what um, my mindset and a lot of, I think, people in comics on mindset is we, we're used to being, you know, a thousand yards back looking at a, looking at a problem and thinking how those, you know, how that, that world can be re recreated. And that was the vision that, I, that I've always had for rewriting Extinction. And um, what was behind my and our desire to pull together a, a collaboration of different charities and projects from all over the world and to not look at the world as borders and organizations and charities and governments, but to actually look at it from the point of view of, okay, well, what are the most important species on the planet? What do they do? What do they need? Okay, well, let's raise some money and make those things happen and give all of them the best possible chance of survival and rebuild ecosystems so that we don't need human intervention anymore. We just leave them alone. We've given them what they need. Step back. We let, you know, that or that sort of restoration happen. And it's, it is great. And comics did help. Actually, the, the first original call out that I made to the first um, big uh, experts, activists and celebrities who joined was actually a comic. I, I made a comic of the project to say, here you go. Here's who I am. Here's what the project is. And here's what we want to achieve. Um, so, yeah, it really did help. Um, and I think. I think for me, also the tangibility of our project, the fact that when people donate to us, they can physically see how much land we're buying, rewilding, species that are being saved and the species that are being reintroduced. We actually top that up on our website. So if you go there now, you can see, for example, that I think we've got uh, 65 acres we're, we're buying and we've, we've actually protected two species from uh, any extinction that would be caused by humanity. We've also um, we've been working to uh, raise awareness. So, for example, in Scotland, there's a, a half a million acres being rewilded. There's very tangible things. And to go back to your question, that was what was in the original comic. Here are the places in the world we want to affect. Here are the animals we want to save. Here's the money we'd need to do it. I love that. I, I want you to back up now and 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 let's let's. Um really go into what your uh, goal you're you're hoping to achieve with this book and I think in some respects you've already started to almost overachieve on on some of those great ambitions but the that what you want to do is also very big it's a uh, global it's uh, uh, deals with uh, uh, species extinction it deals with a uh, uh, biodiversity a lot of things that are kind of systemic and and tie to one another but there's or, or i'd like you to mention the organizations involved and some of the the ways that you're doing that and also as you as you mentioned the, the website kind of how it's already taken off it's going gangbusters and people are really loving it yeah absolutely and i, and I need to give so much credit to um, all of the people involved in the project. So for everyone listening, we have seven beneficiary charities, which is uh, Greenpeace, the World Land Trust, Born Free, Rewild, it's the, uh, the, the Wildlife Trust in the UK, it's Reserva and it's Rewild in Europe. And the reason those seven charities were chosen was specifically each of them has their own speciality, their own thing they work in that is that links up to a, a plan that actually restores not just the ecosystems and the biodiversity but also helps with climate change too because what we've done is with those charities we found the places on the earth that are basically that almost like that fire breaks they're the ones that are keeping the biodiversity crisis from getting worse and stopping climate change getting worse generally what they what happens in those places there they've been lived on for generation after generation of indigenous peoples and those indigenous peoples have called it their home and they've looked after, they've had incredible stewardship over it, but they're under threat right now by illegal mining and by their land being sold. So what we do is one of our main causes with the World Land Trust and Reserva is we actually work with those indigenous people to buy their land for them. So they own their land, which gives them legal power to resist some of the mining in the meat industry and the, the people who would otherwise take their land so that's one part the the protection 
the other part is systemic change, which is where we're working with Greenpeace, um, which is changing the harmful laws and the business practices that specifically are driving creatures and species to extinction. There are some ridiculous and stupid laws. I don't wanna get sued, I'm not gonna name all of them, but as one example, on the back of fishing boats, there's the, the line that comes out the back. I think, and I may get the numbers, I think it, it was currently about 36 degrees. What happens is albatross can see that line and get caught on the line and they die. By changing the angle, it means their eyes can't witness it anymore. They don't see it. Problem solved. Those, there's, there's thousands, thousands of these laws all across the planet that by a small intervention, you can save a whole species. So that's what Greenpeace are doing. And then the third part of what we're doing is restoration, which is with rewilding Europe, rewild the wildlife trusts, reserve and born free. And what those are doing is they're looking at individual species and individual collections of species in Africa, in South America, in Southeast Asia, Australia, Europe, Portugal. And by the reintroduction of a species like the Tasmanian devil into Australia, what happens is then the Tasmanian devil will actually pick up the detritus on the forest and woodland floor, build their homes underground. And because you don't have that highly flammable detritus across the woodlands, it reduces wildfires and it also changes the ecosystems so that all of the species connected to that Tasmanian devil then flourish too. And also with these species, so I'll just name a few, you've got the mask and bear in Europe, you've got the beavers in the UK, which reduce flooding. You've got the Iberian lynx, you've got the vulture, the bison. By reintroducing these species, just as happened in, with the wolves in Yellowstone, you rebuild the entire ecosystem that they go within. You level out that predator-prey relationship, the, the actual the flora and the fauna starts to flourish. And if by reintroducing these species into these key parts across the planet, all of our homes, all of the areas we live in will be far more beautiful. There will be more, there'll be a, a louder thrum of nature and it will just be, the world will be a better place for everybody. People can go and, get those experiences they can only get by traveling to Asia or to Africa or wherever they can get them in their own country and what a beautiful thing that would be absolutely beautiful for for sure um that's why the most important comic book on earth I I, I think the title is so fitting um because it, it's really not just about um being the most important book it's also having the most important impact long term for our future plus there's many pluses and, and i'd like to hear from you some of those that you're seeing so not only are you, you able to buy land not only you're able to support those charities but you're also touching the lives of different audiences that are vi maybe visual learners they're um they're at a different um level of reception on what type of materials they read and consume they'd like to see something visual they want to hear a story they want to understand that better um, maybe age difference or, or maybe that's just how they learn um, to, to get them that way it's another tool for parents it's another tool for um, a, a form of media that is is hugely advancing what what else am I missing that that this has? It's almost more. I would say more than a ten x impact or factor, a multiplier, on the different mediums. All not only the six senses in some respect, but all these different ways that you're reaching people. Well, yeah, you're absolutely. Uh, you you really hit the nail on the head. Um, the reason I chose comics is because they they have they're, they're completely non exclusionary. So no matter your educational background, no matter if English is your first or your third, or even not if the language you understand, with a visual medium, you can understand things and you can also care immediately. That's what we're here to do. So we're not here to educate people about how many species are going extinct. We're here to educate people about why you should care and also what you can do and hopefully having some fun with it. So we found, for example, we, we launched a comic with um, Meat Free Monday, the McCartney family uh, um, charitable project. 
And um, they emailed us and said, this is our best performing post to date. We've never had anything this big before. And we found with that one, um, we've got about 30,000 followers on Instagram. 12,000 of our followers saw and liked the post, but 326,000 followers, completely non-environmental, no interest in, well, they might have no immediate direct interest in environmentalism or biodiversity or going meat free or vegan or vegetarian. So 326,000 people who would never have heard an environmental message heard that comic. And that's, that's the power of something that is fun and entertaining, non-preachy, non-political, but also really easy to digest. And um, to go back to your, your point about the audiences, we found that actually, <laughs> we, I, I should say we, I, I squarely thought that the audience would be the kind of the Instagram audience between 25 to 40, people who are time poor, flicking through something quick and easy. That was my, I guess, my target. But actually, we've definitely nailed that. But the book, the physical anthology book, that has been really well picked up by a younger audience, an over 55 audience, and a non English speaking or people from a less uh, people who've had not had the benefits of a, of a broader education, those audiences seem to have loved it. So I'd love to say by design, but probably more by luck, between giving comics away online on social media and the physical book, we've actually got a really nice spread. And I think that, that hopefully speaks to the power of comics. You've also, what, now in the second print run or third print run, it's sold out how many times? Yeah, so we saw it twice, which is great. So it's, I think it's the third print run now, but it gets a little bit confusing because we're printing in different countries for different languages and so on and so forth. So um, it might be the third for the UK, but it could be the first or the second or the fourth in America, and it could be the second in Africa. Um, but yeah, we, we are luck, really lucky. Um, um, well, it's, it's, it's a very loved project. Um, I was at that uh, convention the other day and we, because of COVID is quite rife in the UK, we were expecting it to be quite quiet, respectively. And we turned up and we thought, oh, 100, 100 books, you know, that's going to be easily enough. And we sold out in, in two hours, um, which is wonderful. It was just a big queue of people just really wanting to not only do something tangible, um, because each book roughly... Uh, can get about th each book roughly equates to the value of about three meters of rainforest that we can purchase afterwards. So it's a very easy, tangible thing. Okay, buy that book, three meters of rainforest is going to be fine. It does other things too, but there's a combination of people wanting to help, but a bigger, a much bigger audience of people who are like, I just want to read a comic by Jane Goodall. I want to, I want to see what Alan Moore, for example, is who's retired from comics. Um, came out of retirement to do the comic for us and we're the only place you can see that so there was fans of all of the individual con contributors there was fans of environmentalism and there's then there's just people who just have this curiosity to see what the, the fuss is about and yeah and it's meant that we've been number one in the book chart since we launched um, we're also being picked up as kind of the book of the year by a few different places and yeah we're, we're officially a bestseller which is wonderful and what that does is it has a media impact, you know, because we're, we're a very short term. Um, so we have very short term tangible solutions. So if we get the money in one week, we can go the next week and say, hey, can we go get that land, please? Can we stop that, uh, that destruction of that bit of land over there by purchasing it? So, yeah, it's, it's that all been... is so beautiful. My goodness, <laughs> it's it, uh, um to be involved in such a project and even as someone who just purchases the book as um, uh, once you've finished it, it's such a, it's, I'm sure it's such a satisfying thing to be involved in that. And it's also the ticklings or the beginning steps of that empowerment or that education on it's not too hard to, to actually get involved in, and, and, and helping uh, rewrite extinction, helping to uh, the things that are going on in our world from 
losing species to climate change that are all kind of interconnected and tied together. There uh, is wonderful sections in here about Extinction Rebellion and talking about how people who were police officers and people who were artists and creatives somehow by happenstance or by accident kind of got uh, put into that where they said, okay, I didn't think that was my thing. And then the more I became aware or I would go on a trip to Switzerland and, and see the destruction of the glaciers and the places I love to hike and then come back to where I lived and there was these movements going on and, and these little stories through comics that were so beautifully told of how can you find your right place to kind of get involved? And every, every one of us is at a different place of, of learning where we're at. You know, some of us are uh, maybe huge carnivores and drive a big SUV and we're just in a different place in our world uh, uh, of how we live and interact. But then through understanding how the world works and what's going on, that flips the switch or it picks us up where we're at to, to look into it a little bit further. And I think this is such a beautiful work that really does that well in, in many ways. Um, Thanks, I, Mark. I, yeah, no, you're, 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 you're most welcome. Um, I'm going to give you tons of accolades because, because you really deserve them. This is, is a great work. And I, I don't want it to end. I want to the, the second most important comic book on earth. I want, I, I want to see multiple versions of this. And that's why I'm kind of talking now a little bit, um, about some things and I want to know if you're already doing them, if you're planning on them, if there's things in, in, in the future coming up and, and I want to touch on a, on a bunch of different ways. So just recently we had this big release from Mark Zuckerberg, the, uh, the metaverse, um, which, you know, um, good, bad or ugly. It is what it is, but uh, uh, there's a lot going on with NFTs and, um, especially in the in the in the comic arena or artwork mm. arena as well um uh cri tokenization cryptocurrencies uh, with nfts and, and that um is there anything like that planned these future ways to get even another audience in there um and the reason i ask you and it's no funny business i'll be very honest when uh, Mark Zuckerberg first, and, and maybe this is where I get controversial, when he first announced it, he uh, within the first few minutes, he says, my favorite game is Arizona Sunshine, which is a zombie shoot 'em up game. I don't know if you're, you're well aware of that. And then about an hour or maybe even two hours in, into it or quite a bit into it, he says, and I'm so excited to to announce the rising star, my favorite game of all time, Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas Fall, and I, my jaw about fall, fell off. I'm a grandpa, I have four adult children, uh, five grandchildren or fifth grandchild on the way. And um, no matter how much I like my quest, no matter how much I like augmented reality, no matter how much I love comics, um, a game that uh, in the future is, stealing cars, prostitution, rape, shooting people, you know, this violence and theft. That's not the future that I want. It's a very dystopian. And um, how can we get good futures out there to that same metaverse, to that same NFTs? How can we have clean NFTs that are helping us at the same time pay for rainforest, pay for land, pay for different things. Uh, what's on the horizon there? And what are your thoughts or feelings in that in that direction? Yeah, um, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the first one in terms of things that we're doing, we've got a, uh, a clothing deal with Rapa Nui, uh, also known as T-Mill. Um, so people, because people have been uh, contacting us regularly about saying they want some clothing made that kind of has that feel that vibe that, that we've got. So that'll be coming. In terms of NFTs, uh, it's a bit of a, of a subject I, I'm not a complete uh, um, new about. I do know quite a bit about NFTs. At the moment, I'm trying to see if there's a carbon positive way we can do it. And if there is, then that will potentially be a thing. 
Um, because as I you belong say, to the clean NFT discord group and uh, yeah. I probably have the, the most uh, advanced compendium on clean NFTs that there is. So I'll send you the please. invite and, and that so Thank that you. you can have it. Yeah, absolutely. Mark. And that'll be amazing. Cause um, I would with NFTs, I want to do something that goes more than goes further than being clean. It actually does something that is continually positive. And that's why I want, what, that's basically, I think the way that the world will work. Actually your, your vision of the future, I think is probably more likely to be true than Mark Zuckerberg's. Um, a vision of the future, I think where people want to make their purchasing cho choices and their entertainment choices, because they know they're one guilt-free and two helping become more and more of a thing. You'll see more brands trying to align themselves to charity projects and to things that actually benefit um, the planet. And I'm involved in another project called Rewired Earth, which is basically looking to um, help the investment sector, the financial markets, understand what people want from them. In other words, where they want to see their money invested. And also uh, it gives, it's a little bit like food labeling. So every investment will basically say it's red, amber, green for the planet, red, amber, green for people, red, amber, green for prosperity and red, amber, green for governance. So anyone who is buying any product anywhere and who's investing in any company anywhere will very simply be able to see if that company or that product is good or bad for the planet and people and so on and so forth. And what that does then is that drives the companies who have red, 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 red to want to become green, 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 green. And I think it's going to be more of a thing that your vision, the idea that actually in the future, companies, brands, big players will be like, it will be a race to the front to be the, the most positive for the planet and the most beneficial to people. And actually, I am stupidly optimistic that the actual, the way that the future will be is in everyone trying to be to be the champion of who's helping the most competing I, to be champion that's a beautiful yeah. vision I, I think it's true and also also one of the things i'm trying to do as well is uh create uh, some tv shows um <laughs> so i might get like a, a dog poo through the post for charlie brooke for saying this but what he did for for black mirror i want to do with green mirror basically pointing forward to a future that um is environmentally like organized but still has like that still has that same sort of like really beautiful satirical storytelling still those moments of joy and depression and like utter heartache that he gets in black mirror but with green mirror um so yeah I, i'd like to do that but um this music time. to my ears <laughs> i can't believe it i cannot tell you there's uh at least more than a dozen podcasts that i've done where i always try to interject my mainly with directors and and um tv uh series producers uh, or even authors um documentary filmmakers I've, I've really tried to have this conversation and i want to have it with you as well because uh, uh, you just brought it up that, that, that's the biggest reason okay I'll, I'll pretty much we have ted talks we have black mirror uh and then what we see on on tv is really dystopian futures it's fighting over competition over resources it's a uh, these gray um dystopian sci-fi futures uh the talking fridges and not really any i mean what i just mentioned about mark zuckerberg the metaverse i don't you know I, i'd like to i'd like to have a metaverse that shows us the the resilient desirable regenerative futures these futures that we can achieve and create and i i i want to know a couple of things so i i call it movie magic like mm -hmm. they did back in Star Trek, like we, they do in Black Mirror. But I want to do the movie magic that shows us what if we achieve all the sustainable development goals by 2030? What if we, yeah, what if we achieve all this by 2050? What does that movie magic make that world look and feel like so that I can say, oh, that's pretty exciting. I think I want to live in that future and I'm an architect, I'm an engineer, I'm a comic book a, a artist or a writer. And, and now I'm going to do all I can to create that narrative, that story or engineer, create an architect for that future. In comic books, if you're trying to build this future, for it's not movie magic. It's 
it's just comics. What is it? Is, is there a term for it that 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 you're creating these uh, non dystopian futures and visions that people can see and feel and say they open the book and say, oh, actually, that's pretty good. I, I'd like to let's engineer for that. Is that possible? What do we need to do? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're definitely preaching to the converted. That is something that has been on my radar that I'm actively working on and active trying to do right now. Um, because how can we possibly tell people there's a better future without presenting it to them? They need to know what, what great looks like. They need to know that that it gives people hope as well. And it, it unites people. It, it's, so you were saying about architects. Architects do, don't they? They, they draw like the building or the, whatever it is that they're, they're designing. And people go, oh, that looks wonderful. Let's make that vision happen. We need to be doing that with environmentalism. Not in this kind of worthy science driven way, but just like, come on, guys, this would be so much better. Imagine you could just jump in your car and go and see, I don't know, like I said, like a, a bear, right? Like just a few, like a few like miles down the road. Imagine you could see some of these wonderful creatures that used to be, um, that used to live in our country, but now have been pushed out for extinction. We can reintroduce them. We can build a better world. You can do things like take take trips and actually, you know, it's actually benefiting the planet rather than um, depleting it. And it would just be all of us could just live a much happier life and actually not feel the, the, the kind of the existential dread and guilt that we all feel right now, because it's very, very hard currently to make good choices. You have to really, really think all the time about your choices. And you also have to have a level of knowledge and expertise and education to make the right choices. But if we can actually present a future where that, that's taken away and actually we know, we fundamentally know and understand that the things that are in place, the systemic things that are in place are actually benefiting the planet. How, come, how, how cool would that be <laughs> to not have these like <laughs> these sleepless nights like, oh, do I go for yeah. this product or this one? Uh, let me go do a thesis on which one's better. And I and see, that's why I take it as even a step further. So that's why I'd like to see more issues of of this or something along the lines come out and also the movies or the tv series that you that come on i would like to see something that as a, a series that every week you can guarantee once a week there's a new series coming out that's that's whether it's the the uh, desperate housewives of 2030 or whether it's um, I love that okay. uh, yes yeah, so, you know something that just shows what does it look and feel like in 2030 and, and um, that's there's no bit of dystopian we still have problems we still have get divorced and fight or whatever else is in you know just life mm. but we're not we're not killing each other we're not uh, setting up borders and walls we're also not um living in this dystopian world that that humanity has found a balance to say okay and this is what the sustainable development goals do for me and also the resilience development goals or resilience frontiers does after the uh, 2030 is it sets the bar higher it says this is an entirely new operating system for our planet and we're never going to let humanity go below this level again. And that goes for species as well. We basically say, no, we're not going to have 200 species die every single day or, uh, or whatever the number is. That's unacceptable. We're setting the bar higher and the entire globe is going to commit to the standard. And it's not only an inalienable right for every human being on earth, it's an inalienable right for all species on planet which we need for our survival as well. Fish go extinct, if species go extinct, uh, bees uh, uh, start having problem and disappearing, that affects us. Our basic energy source is tied to that biome, that ecosystem surviving and thriving. And uh, the more we destroy that and choke off our planet with greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuels and bad air, the worse it gets. And so let's flip that switch start living within the planetary boundaries, but raise that bar. And so I feel that materials like this constantly bombarding us, just like all the dystopian things we, I mean, there's plenty of Netflix or TV series to choose from that don't bring you a hill of beans. They're great to watch and entertaining, but they don't really give us anything to strive for. They're just, we're turning into mindless zombies. 
one idea I had, and I don't, I don't know if you have a comment to this or not, is uh, um, what's the, the big, is it Big Mama, Terry? Um, oh, yeah, Big Mama's house, you mean? Yeah, but what's the actor's name? Isn't it? Terry, uh, uh, oh yeah, my God, you, yeah. You know who I mean. I know. Terry, in my, yeah. One I of those things, someone asks you a question that you know, and you're like, Terry right? something. But anyway, he owns this, the biggest production studio in the United States. It's bigger mm. than a couple production studios. And I think that's where they do The Walking Dead and many others. It's got a full uh, scale White House building there and everything. But instead of, you know, doing a series of eight, nine, 10 episodes, however many they did of The Walking Dead, let's do that many of The Walking 2030 or The Thriving 2030, whatever we want to call it, mm. and just show that vision. Okay, we've got all electric vehicles. We're using wind and, and solar and hydrogen, green hydrogen. We've, you know, we've gotten off of fossil fuels. We're we're really restoring areas. We're thriving. We're in abundance. Uh, and, yeah. and yet there's still drama. There's still divorce. There's still this, this narrative that's fun to watch, but you're just like, wow, that'd be cool. I, I, want, I want to live in that world. Let's start working towards that. But we need to have something after we leave that job in the coal mine or in the, uh, you know, in, uh, at Facebook that we can have to vision something else instead of say, oh, let's let's play another hour of uh, Grand Theft Auto. And you, I've, I've got to give really uh, big credit to people like yourself and and all the visionaries out there because that's we won't reach people by saying um, Tyler so Perry. Yeah. Oh, now now I'm with sorry. you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, we won't reach people by saying 200 species going extinct every day because it's, it's a number. It you can't feel it. You have to have storytelling. Um, it's a really one I've used so many times in, in talks and things. Um, I'll just give you one little anecdote and then I'll, I'll get back to your question. Um, there was a, a, a figure I heard, a fact I heard, that uh, a billion creatures in, in, uh, that live off or in sea every day are being affected or killed by plastic pollution, a billion. It's impossible. You can't, you cannot physically understand that number. You can't picture it as you, your brain can't cope with that, that, that sort of size and scale. Jenny Jinya made a comic about an albatross mother who was looking to feed her chick something. And she was flying around and all she could find was plastic pollution. So she was feeding her chick cigarette butts, little bottle caps and unfortunately she couldn't understand why her chick was getting more and more sick so she kept feeding more and more plastic to her chick and the chick died and in the comic the the, the loving reaper who's jane's character talks to the mother and says you know you did all you could it's not your fault and this mother is left with the with her, her dead chick that story has been seen by tens of millions of people and what it did it, it humanized what seabirds go through every day so to go to your point we need to make stories and i specifically am working on stuff exactly like you're talking about short film tv series broadcast where actually climate change and biodiversity isn't isn't the focus a good story is the focus but it bleeds in that environmentalism and I need to just make two more quick points that will hopefully. Oh, there's add a plenty bit of time. I, I I've talked too much. I want to hear your stories. It's about you. Well, thank you. It's not about me at all. Everyone out there is is doing that bit. But um, there's one there's one of these two things I think is particularly helpful. Um, in the UK in the 1980s, uh, there was a law passed that people had to put on their seatbelt before they drove. And there was a, an advertising campaign that had this little fun little ditty. It says, clunk, click before you take that trip. And it was widely reported that basically that little fun ditty stopped people from being killed in car crashes because they then had the little ditty in their head and they put the seatbelt on. But that's not true. It wasn't the advert that made people put their seatbelt on. It was a little, little kind of, I guess, standard or law that was passed that whenever people got into cars, the, the director, the editor had to show someone put their seatbelt on before they drove, which meant that it was subconscious behavior. When we sit in a car, 
we instantly start reaching for the seatbelt to put it on because it's the expected behavior. That's what we need to do for environmentalism. So that the right choices we make are expected behavior and we see it everywhere. So whether it's in a film, a documentary, whether it's in a reality TV show, we see people making the good choices and it becomes learned behavior that we don't think about. It's not a conscious thing. You think, oh, I'm gonna separate my food waste. I'm gonna find the right place to recycle this. It just becomes a thing that people do without thinking. And the second point is I need to give incredible um, props, support and love to BAFTA Albert, which you mentioned before. And for people who don't know, I was involved in BAFTA Albert for, I've been involved at, at different levels for many years. It is start place was a calculator. So every hour of broadcast, the, uh, the, the broadcast would put in all their numbers, you know, tell them how many tons of carbon were getting used per hour. And then based upon the information they put in, it would make recommendations of how to reduce that number. And at the end of the, the process, if the total tonnage of carbon was over a certain threshold, it would not be broadcast. Wonderful thing. One of the most proudest moments of my life to be involved in it. And that involves Netflix, as you're saying, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, BBC, Sky, uh, broadcasts all over the world. And what happens every year is they reduce that number down and they offer better advice about how to improve the, for example, the catering or the transport. And every year, thousands and thousands of tons of carbon are saved every minute of broadcast because of that tool. But that is the systemic change. But what Albert are doing now is they're also advising all of these big broadcasts to say, make better environmental choices part of your normal programming remit. So you have The Walking Dead. Show subtly, but not in a judgmental, not in a sort of a heavy handed effect heavy-handed way show the impacts of environmentalism what good behavior looks like so that is a message going out to the whole broadcast industry across all of the world to say make better choices in what you commission and what you show so that is happening now so you'll see in the next five to ten years gradually it will be background but in the background of all the shows you're watching the good broadcasters will start putting things in there, beneficial things for the planet inside their normal broadcasting. And for me, that is where we'll change the world. It won't be by people like me making a very, hopefully it will be, but it will be me, but, but people like me making a very specifically targeted environmental project. It will be by reaching the 80% of people who normally can't or don't care about it, them being educated, subtly carefully and lovingly on the shows they already know that's where the for me the world would change and yeah i just want to give albert and all the people involved just a massive massive deal of credit because people don't hear about them and they're fantastic yeah they don't hear about it and it is it is fantastic but it's also a way that you turn that movie magic into reality in a lot of respects so not only are they putting uh, mu movie magic in on how to live in the future or what's very good for the environment and species in the future. But then they're slowly applying those practices in that movie magic process. And so the, the, there are really ways, I mean, in The Walking Dead, there's a lot of positive things. They, they started to grow their own food and have their own animals. They um, really did solar and I think and even try to do wind. Um, then they fought over, I think, oil making or gas making process for, for a while. Um, which was which was very put in a very negative light and I think that whether you look at that or if you look at Games of Thrones I think if if we get more of those positive messages or how do we project a different living way in the future it, it, it's a, it's really fabulous and there was I just opened up the book that I, I want to come back to you but there's and I hope I it's okay to show these but, it's, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the question, um, boy, that's a cool iPhone. Where did you get it? Mm -hmm. How much did it cost? 
And then, you know, the laser, oh, well, tells the price, but really how much did it cost? There's a, there's a child that had to mine rare metals and, and, and horrible conditions, or how much debt did it cost the trees that were cut down, the total environmental cost, the true cost. And sometimes that's just not clear. We, we don't think beyond the end of our nose. And I, I love how in many respects, not only the comic book, but in your thinking and, and the people you involved, 300 people uh, involved in this project are really thinking long-term. They're thinking about the future. How can we start now <laughs> to, to get some of these stories and these different mediums to, to present those, those different futures? You've already touched on a, a couple of these questions already, but I want to go more specifically and give you some harder questions now. Um, Come on, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2018, the entire world switched to a syst systemic approach. Um, all international organizations, World Trade Organization, UN, World Economic Forum, uh, on and on, World Bank, all switched to a systems view of life approach, meaning they started to implement systems into their models to solve global grand challenges, meaning that instead of taking a siloed approach or just addressing one facet of our global grand challenge or a problem, they says, no, the only way we're going to solve this is through a systemic approach. We need to address all the facets uh, of a complex problem or a global grand challenge and, um, and address all of them to, to solve the problem. And that happened in 2018. By doing this book, how do you feel about this uh, systemic approach that we're taking? And do you believe as well that that's the only way to solve our global grand challenges? Or do you have other opinions on that? I, 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 I don't believe it's the only way, no. I believe it's absolutely part of the puzzle. Um, they, they have that, that thing, don't they? You say that it only takes 20% of the world to actually change the world. And what we need is the systemic part at the top of the tree, um, well, the top of the pyramid, if you go wherever you refer to, the systemic part gives us the structure to control how business operates, how government operates, and how we actually deliver and uh, deliver a set of objectives that everyone can sign up to. But that won't change the world. It, we also need that individual behavioral change and the individuals to basically rise up and say that I will support the big global systemic changes. Politicians, businesses, shareholders, they do what they think is right for their constituents and the people who have basically are funding their things. If we as a population don't give the signals to those people that we will support the changes that are going to save the planet, they won't do it. It's very easy to attack politicians and governments and say, they're not doing it, they don't care. But the reason they're not doing it often is because they don't know they'll get the support for it. They don't know that people will be, are prepared to go through the changes in their life that will be necessary for that systemic change. It takes all of us, all throughout all those levels, we all have to push in the same direction. Um, I was actually chatting to someone the other day who made a really good point. It's like, if someone says, we as a global nation need to reduce our carbon by 60% or 50% or whatever it is, it's very easy to say, well, I didn't, I, my piece is not gonna make any difference to that big figure because your one piece doesn't, but if that's 8 billion people, of course it does. It's much better to say we all, at all levels, need to reduce our carbon by 60%. There's, oh, okay, that's an individual behavior I need to make. And that is where the world will change, with people making small, loads and loads of small choices that are better, and the governments and the businesses making the big choices that give the framework for the machine to start being a, a, a force for positivity, which it isn't right now. Um, I need to feel the need to just <laughs> re-mention Rewired Earth because it's exactly what we're looking to do there, which is um, systemic change with businesses and the 90 trillion plus of investments that happen. Um, but base those investments that are going to happen going forward on a specific global bit of research we want to do where we talk 
to as many people from all over the planet as we can, a really big scale user research piece where we understand what are the positive things that people want to see businesses and governments invest in. So we get the really big sentiment analysis from a global population saying, what do you care about? Then we present that to those 90 trillion plus of businesses and say, if you invest in these things, these people will love you, your share price will go up, but also you'll do more for the planet and also you'll be getting people to support you and your work because they know that you're doing what they're asking for. And yeah, so that I think my, my long answer was what I said and my short answer is no, I don't think it can just be systemic. It has to be people driven too. Are you a global citizen and how would you feel about the removal of all borders, walls, and limitations separating humans one from another. What's your well, view, uh, <laughs> your understanding of this? And, and uh, did, did it change once the pandemic hit? Was your view different before the pandemic? And is it different now? No, I've always considered myself to be a global citizen. Um, I actually wrote and am writing a comic series on it at the moment called Extinction 2040 which is part of an anthology called The 77, um, which is all about that very thing, all about the, the, the um, removal of borders in a, in a kind of a global population. Um, I think if you're, it, I think, and have worked in uh, what's called future threats. Uh, future threats is what, what governments and businesses look at and say, what are the big scary things coming down the line that we should be aware of? For me, one of the biggest threats facing humanity is climate migrancy on a global scale, when the, the global south particularly will heat up to such an extent you can't make food there and it becomes unlivable for humans. That will see a mass migration, which could then cause a push for uh, more extremist behavior, more far right politics to keep um, borders safe and so on and so forth, which would be a concern. But also, I think the other big threat is that people will start, well, we call it a threat or it's a good thing, but people will start to identify more with people who feel and act the same as them, as opposed to people who live close to them. And I think that's true of all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, I have so much more in common with someone, like one of my friends from Northern Sumatra um, than I do with some people who live a few doors down from me. I have nothing in common with them often you know I, the only thing i have in common is locality and what what basis is, is that for being friends i mean i don't know i am still friends with them but you know what i mean it's not it's not a value judgment it's a location-based judgment whereas um punky for example in in north and smart Church, he's one of the dearest people on the planet and we think and we respond to things in a very similar ma manner and I think that's what's going to happen. I don't think the walls of tomorrow will be between, say, England and, and USA. I think it's more likely to be between groups, large super groups of people who feel the same way about something with large super groups of people who feel the opposing way. That will be, will be the, the change. And the, the piece of work I was doing on that about future threats was all around what would it look like if we didn't have, for example, uh, you know, a US army or a British army or a French army? What would it look like if we didn't have a US, UK or French border force? What would the world look like if a whole group of young people all over the planet renounced their national identity? Billions of children said, I don't wanna be American. British. And can you tell us what 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 came out of it, or what you saw, or what? Yeah, yeah well, uh, you could you can buy the comic. It's, <laughs> it's an ongoing series. Uh, um, okay. In the seventy seven, and um, yeah, it follows gr basically a group of young young teenagers who get conscripted into the kind of border force, and what they're doing is they're trying to keep borders open, or they've been told by the government they need to keep the borders open. They don't necessarily feel that way themselves but there's not much employment in this world because they're trying to hang on to consumerism and a capitalist uh, um, environment. So these, these young teenagers are being conscripted into almost like a warlike service to fight for things they don't believe in. 
And that's the basic crux of stories. It's, it's a group of four teenagers being pushed into a war zone um, whereby there's a criminalization of people who feel exactly like they do. So yeah, so I can tell you what I think about it, but it's easier to just buy the comic yeah, and actually well, read it. Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, look it up and put a link in the show description, as well as uh, all, all the links that you sent me about uh, rewriting Extinction. Um, Thanks, Mark. The, the, the global citizen question is really kind of interesting. It's also interesting in rewriting Extinction because during the pandemic, when we were in lockdown, when there were really nations and borders more so than we've ever seen, um, boy, birds, species, animals, they were all still moving across borders. Food was moving over. Food was definitely a global citizen. Um, yeah. The humanity kind of was on lockdown for, for, for the most part. Um, some of us were wise enough to get moving. And so it, it's interesting to hear that, you know, how, how do we make ourselves so much different and or separate ourselves from other species mm. when it comes to global, uh, maybe global citizens, the wrong word, maybe it's global species that, that you know, crew member of spaceship Earth. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't, I, yeah, I, I think there's just, as always, there's so much you can learn from the animal kingdom. You know, I mean, it's unfortunately, no matter how you, f I, I think, no matter how all of us feel about the pride from our, where we've came from and our cultures, I think all of us can recognize that there's a, there's a thin line between being proud of your culture and the people you live with and, and what your culture represents. And that being something that can be hit over somebody else's head. Um, and it's, it's, I would never want to decry anyone being proud of who they are or where they come from or their country. But I also think that everyone should have the freedom to make their own choices and to, yeah, I think when it comes down to things like the enforcements, that's where I start to feel far less comfortable because even Why when you not... say it, you make a sigh in your voice. Like it's it's definitely not something easy to no. talk about. No, it's not. And it's there's so much emotion and history and family and culture wrapped up in it. And we always have to be very aware, all of us, that 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 you know the, the life that I've lived is different to yours and different to everyone else listening here. We don't necessarily have the same background and we've not trodden the same path as they have but it just to me it seems sensible that there should be the capacity to link hands with somebody who isn't born in the same street the same area the same state or country as you and to look at that person and say you know you're my brother or sister and you know we're in this together i you know th that seems like a beautiful thing to me in fact, you just sparked a memory that I probably shouldn't say, I'm going to say anyway. So when I was at COP26, um, we went to somebody from uh, a Middle Eastern delegation who um, they were being pressured to leave their, their fossil fuels in the ground. And their point was, we're being pressured by the USA and UK and other, other countries who've greatly benefited from fossil fuels and being told that we can't extract them. But those fossil fuels will help to fund our education, the, the furtherance of our nation. You know, we're, we're under 70 years old. You know, you have houses older than that in the UK. How can you, in all conscience, say we shouldn't take this oil out and exploit it? And, and also they made the second point, which I will get back to. They made the second point where he said, also climate change is not equal. Climate change for their country would mean a rising of sea levels, which would give them access to fresh water they don't have right now. That could be a benefit. So I countered that argument, or both the arguments. The first one where they said, you know, you've benefited, why should we not? And I think that's like saying my brother was a bully, my older brother was a bully, therefore it's okay for me to be a bully. It's like, no, that you've learned something. We have a nation, we know things as a world, we know things we didn't know back then. It doesn't mean what happened from developed nations abusing fossil fuels is okay for 
newer nations to also abuse it. Yes, we need equity and equality so that the newer nations are able to benefit from some of the things that we've benefited from, of course, as, a, as a other countries. But that doesn't mean it's okay to make the same mistakes twice. You know, just because you, you've seen someone else do bad behavior doesn't mean it's okay for you to. Um, and the second point they made, which is when they were saying about uh, climate change would mean fresh water for their citizens, and that could be a good thing. I don't know about you, Mark, but it seems like saying, oh, yeah, I know that person's on fire, but my hands are getting quite nice and warm from them. <laughs> yeah, like... it's exactly like saying so, you know, it's like, uh, so we need to have so many million people die and uh, be displaced. Um, so you get your beach you can enjoy you some get your fresh property. water <laughs> and then what once they have that fresh water does it become a commodity then is it protected by nations and borders from military is it then only for them and then the rest are left to fight so there's so so many things that come up come up on that as well one one thing that came up as you mentioned that is really um and i i see it where i'm at as well in germany is is the fact that um we're stuck into some of these fossil fuel situations that that we're in just you, you said you know our our some of our homes are older than the history of their country you know or yeah. or, or or uh that but that also means that that infrastructure of those homes are still stuck on some outdated non very n not very good for the environment uh, fossil fuels, you know, oil, you know, oil coming, uh, uh, natural gas or uh, propane or, uh, you know, a uh, kerosene or, or whatever it is in some of these homes um, that are sitting on outdated infrastructure that's not in very efficient, not very good for our air quality and things like that as well, um, as well as, you know, all over the world. Uh, um, we don't realize what a big impact air conditioning and cooling does. You know, on the inside, it's nice and great, and the ambient temperature, HVAC, and cooling is great. But on the outside, it's blowing out hot heat out into the streets, and and that's another form of global warming. Yeah. So um, it, it's not. I wish it was that easy, but I'm glad that you brought that up and and that you mentioned that. The last and hardest question I have for you. It's not the last question, but it's the hardest uh, okay. question that I have for you today. But I know you're well prepared. It's um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not for others, just for you. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? So I actually do have an answer for this. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm completely ill-prepared, but I have an answer. Um, for me, it's, it's where the relationships you have and the communities you live in are supporting you and each other. Uh, it sounds a very vague thing, but what I mean by that is that you have localized power, food, production, education, and you have some autonomy about how that's handled. The, um, so, for example, what I mean by that is that generally the people who best know the environment and the way of what's best for them is usually the people who are local to that area. So, for example, here I live in Wiltshire in, in England. I and the people who live here know exactly what would be really beneficial in terms of the, the, the actual topography here, the trees, the species, but also what we want. So having some sort of autonomy of business, employment, education, food production, energy, for me is the way forward. Rather than a systemic approach of top downing all the decisions like you have with the Global Citizens Assembly, bottom upping them so basically the people who are living in those communities have the agency to affect the choices for them so we don't also therefore feel that okay over in for example over in hong kong they have this wonderful financial system we should have that financial system it's like that shouldn't be what we base quality on quality should be on the happiness of the people inside and yeah, I think I'm laboring the point now, but that that's what. No, you hit, like you hit it on the the nail on the head. It was perfect. Local economies, local futures. I I really like that, and I um, I'm also a big believer 
in that um, it, it's also got to come from the bottom up. You know, there's a lot of global decisions that are made that harm a lot of us. You know, there's decisions in, in, in the rainforest from Bolsonaro, from mm -hmm. president of Brazil um, that are being made uh, that affect us all around the world and vice versa in other countries. Um, so we, we really need to, to find, um, act local and think global in some yeah. respects, but I like these local futures. Last three questions are for my guests, or not for my guests, my listeners, those who will be listening to this, um, something that they can take as a sustainable takeaway from you that has the power to impact their lives. And, and basically, if there was one message or even a few messages that you could depart um, that has the power to change my listener's life, what would it be your message? So I should start by saying that I never consider myself an expert, I'm just a normal guy. I just like writing stories. Everything I've learned in this, these two years has been picked up by listening to people who are experts. The first thing to do is to listen to the people who know. Don't listen to your own prejudices, your own bias. I have loads. I had even more back in the day. There are people out there who know what they're talking about and they've researched this stuff and they can actually help you. Listen to them think of them like you would a doctor you know there's there's the, the planet is in ill health you shouldn't be listening to your slightly mad auntie who's got their own opinion on something something go listen to the experts um and specifically tangibly um i've got to tell you a quick story about richard curtis who mentioned this story to me there was a uh, a lady working and uh, she spent her entire life fighting cancers particularly lung cancers so surgically or medically and when she was getting to a certain age, she'd build up a bit of wealth and she went to ask her financial advisor, you know, what actually, where's this money? Where's it invested? What was it doing? And she actually found out that it was being invested in tobacco. And so she found out that her entire life, she dedicated her entire life to stopping lung cancers and her money had killed thousands more people than she'd ever saved. So if there's one thing I'd say to your listeners, go to places like switchit.green. They allow you to see where your money is. If your money is in the wrong place, that's like buying matches for an arsonist. You're unfortunately, it's not your fault, but unfortunately your money is actually probably doing far more harm than you ever will know. And uh, Make My Money Matter, which is Richard's, charity which looks at well, how your money matters they've worked out that your money will do 21 times more harm or good than you could ever do by not flying not eating meat restoring environments so the simple easiest thing and it takes under half an hour move your money to somewhere that's helping the planet really really simple if you've got other ones Clean your oven. Your oven uses loads of extra energy. If it's dirty, a clean oven will actually save lots of money from your energy bill. It'll do great for the planet. And plant clover rather than grass in your lawns. If you plant uh, clover, you'll attract pollinators. You will massively increase the biodiversity, not just for your own home, but on what called wildlife corridors. So basically, pollinators will be moving. If they've got clover to land on, they will uh, bring in other wildlife, wildflowers. And then you're basically, you'll also provide a stop off point and you're much more likely to see a, a rise of not only biodiversity and flying insects and pollinators, but the food in your local area will benefit too. So yeah, anyway, those, those three, money, that's clean your oven and pollinators. <laughs> I love that. Boy, that's the best answer I've had yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what should young writers artists, innovators in your field be, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to really impact their own life, but also make it, make a dent in the world to feel like there's hope and be optimistic. Yeah, well, if, if you're creatives, we're always looking for more people to rewrite extinction. Um, at the moment, it might look that rewriting extinction is a group of very worthy, very kind of professional people kind of telling the world what they should do. That is not what we're about at all. 
We're trying to bring as many people from all over the world to tell their stories of how they're rewriting extinction. So maybe you're doing like a really cool thing locally. Maybe you're not doing very much, but you want to. You can tell your story. You know, that's what we need. And what we'll do, um, we'll also run competitions soon and we'll be highlighting some of the best storytellers. So yeah, get in touch. Let us know. We'd love to chat to you. That's amazing. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Uh, um, don't try and get 300 people <laughs> to contribute towards one book during lockdown. It is, it is harder than you think, even if you think it's really hard. It's hard to think. Um, I say that with a little bit of obviously a bit of humor. Um, but what I would say is that uh, the thing that I would tell myself back in the day is when you're writing stories, don't make the message you're trying to get across explicit, keep it implicit. So with some of my past stuff, you know, I was trying to basically help people say, hey, well, this is really good stuff that you should care about. And I did it when I was trying to think about kind of things around LGBTQ plus rights, BLM, environmentalism, and I was a little bit heavy handed with it. And I think usually being heavy handed with stories is what makes it divisive. So we've seen it with lots of like, uh, particularly reimaginations of 80s brands, where they've taken 80s characters and they've changed maybe the identity or the gender or the race of one of the characters, and it starts this big flame war. Um, I think if you can be helpful by sort of putting your arm around the original fans and saying i understand your love and your desire for it but let's do some stuff that's adjacent to it rather than direct contravention of what you love do some adjacent stuff um that would be something that i would teach myself and there's a particular project I have in mind that, that i don't think will ever see the light of day that i'm specifically talking about that yeah i've made some very different choices now let's put it that way Paul, rewriting Extinction, the most important comic book on earth. It's been a sheer pleasure to get an insight in, into your ideas. Thank you so much for letting Thank us you. all inside of your ideas and taking the time and going into my crazy in-depth questioning. Um, I, I, any way I can work and help on, on a series, on a movie, TV, uh, I, I would love to help. I think we're aligned and that's the future we need. Um, I, I appreciate the kind words and, and, and this is a, an amazing work and it's also already having a huge impact. So thank you very much for your time. That's all I have, unless there's something you forgot to let us know or you wanted to say, I'm done. And I really appreciate your time. No, I just wanted to say thank you, though, Mark. Um, you probably make more difference and impact more people than you'll ever know. And it's, it's people like you who should be on the stage, not people like me. I like building stages, not being the rock star. So just to say a massive thank you for, for like taking the time, promoting what we're doing, that we're writing Extinction, and just, just being a great guy. And, yeah, and I've got to say, the questions were fantastic. I really enjoyed them, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful day. And I hope our paths cross very soon. We'll let's stay in touch. Take care now. Thanks, Paul.